This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Cosmographia podcast. I am Russ. This is my co-host, Kyle. We also are joined by Brad and Randall, as always. It, uh, this is, uh, what is this, the eve of New Year's Eve? This is the eve of New Year's Eve, yes. Yeah. Eve of the eve. Final days of the second decade of the 21st century. It was interesting. This is the end of a decade here. Pretty cool. So. There was so much build up to 2012 and the, and the years and years before that. And now we're like seven, eight years past that. Right. Yeah. That's just, it's that's crazy to consider. Years. It is. We yeah. made it. We made it. What's the next catastrophe somebody's talking about? I, was I, think, a great I think there's a micro Nova coming in 20 years or something. Yeah. It was a great tinfoil hat party we had in 2012. Yes. <laughs> everybody, everybody showed up with all these different awesome tinfoil hats they made and yeah, we partied for the end of the world, but yeah, pyramid head getting in. We were, fa- I mean, we were like going all out, not gonna wake up with a hangover because the world will be ended, right? But dang, had hangovers, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, about, about, oh, maybe two years, what was maybe 2010, I had a, uh, I had a, uh, I had lunch with an author who had written a best selling book on 2012, and uh, pretty much convinced that it was gonna be, I don't know, the apocalypse or some extraordinary thing that was going to happen. And uh, he said, you know, well, wanted to know my take on it. And I said, well, um, you know, I think it's probably just going to be, you know, he named the date. I said, well, it's an interesting date because, you know, we're around December 21st, like the week leading up to it and the week after uh, of 2012, you have this interesting winter solstice alignment between the earth, the sun and the center of the galaxy. So I said, it's going to be a very interesting astronomical phenomena, but beyond that, I don't see any major thing happening. And he was almost incredulous. What? You don't believe that that's going to mark a major, you know, major event? And and I said, well, no, probably not. I just, you know, I think like it's, I said, I think it's going to be very interesting because we, it creates this astronomical alignment that's interesting in itself, but he couldn't really believe that I just didn't think it was going to be the onset of the apocalypse. <laughs> I was all Which in. apparently in hindsight, it wasn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good safe call, yeah. Pretty safe call at this point. You know, just like, you know, remember a lot of people Again. were, were um, <clears throat> going hysterical over the date, the date May 5th of the year 2000. 2000, yeah. Yeah, that was going to be that was going to be it. You know, on in May fifth of the year two thousand, it was going to be an axial shift, and pretty much everything was going to be wiped out, and it was going to be the apocalypse, and it was going to be ultimately triggered by a planetary alignment that, you know, right. and uh, I was a little skeptical from the outset, and then the more I thought about it, and the more I learned, the more skeptical I became. And then there was kind of the same deal. I would be giving a talk well, or whatever, and somebody would, well, you don't think May 5th? You know, I said, ah, I don't think you need to worry about it. I think it'll be just another day. Yeah. And um, Well, I was going to say, what added to that was Y2K. So you had the computer glitch yeah. leading up to 2000. So it's like, okay, well, is this a double whammy? Is this really going to happen simultaneously? So, yeah, that, that was – there was actually more build up that for that I think than the than the planets aligning. But uh, yeah, still people people some reason look look to those supposed endpoints, uh, you know, points of points of change or shift. Those nodes that you know something's going to change here, and and maybe that's a maybe that's an inner desire that you know we realize that things aren't functioning right, that there needs to be a shift. Yeah, or it's a so, legacy left over from the fact that shifts have happened. Um, and exactly. That's a, one of the things, kind of one of the themes that, that we've been talking about through this series of podcasts. And, uh, you know, maybe it's embedded in our memory, the idea that these apocalyptic events do happen from time to time. And of course, 
you know, I, I when I was in uh, high school, I had a poster on my wall that showed um, it showed it was a graphic and it showed California had broken loose from the rest of North America and was sinking and and uh, the the caption on the poster was goodbye California and you know didn't quite happen in the geological sense maybe in the in the ideological and political sense California went bye bye but <laughs> oh maybe that's what it was meaning yeah maybe that's what it meant um, but in any case then. There was a whole succession, and I mean, I made a list and actually wrote an essay called the, the, the Boy Who Cried Wolf Syndrome, where I talked about all the ones that I could remember. You know, in 73, it was Comet Kahootek was going to strike the Earth, and all kinds of people were running around convinced that this Comet Kahootek, which actually never even came close to the, to the Earth, was going to trigger the apocalypse which might be a little bit more realistic than some of the other scenarios because obviously comets do have the potential to trigger apocalyptic events. But yeah, then in November of 78, there was going to be another one that, you know, brought the curtain down on civilization. Then in 1980, and I remember yep. when, when, when uh, Mount St. Helens Mount erupted. Mount St. Helens was 1980, right? Right. And that was considered to be, well, this is the, the, the first barrage of these catastrophes that's going to, basically destroy everything that we know the harbinger so yep that was that was that was may 18th yeah my birthday is may 14th so I've, I've always remembered that 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 was like that big event was right after my birthday and there was such a big hubbub that, talking about well you know what what what's gonna continue after mount st helens blows uh and and actually i lived on the street uh was named mount rainier Oh, so, so yeah, yeah. Right, right, right up the road from Mount St. Helens is Mount Rainier. And that was, that was the road name or the national park that uh, was, it was in the neighborhood, all the Shenandoahs and uh, anyway, anyway, the street names there. Um, it's like, okay, yeah. What it, it made me, it made me aware though, as a, as a 12 or 13 year old of what was going on in the geological, you know, mm -hmm. the world at that time with the, with the volcanic eruption then. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that was just another in this long chain of these things. There's been, I think I, I documented about a dozen of them starting from 1969 up until whenever I wrote this, which was probably around 2015, I think, or 2014 when I wrote it. Um, and basically just saying, you know, the, the, the downside is my point, my point in this, in the story of the boy who cried wolf, you remember he was, uh, you know, this, this lad who was sent out to um, watch the flocks of sheep and he sat out there and, and got really bored and then decided it would be a lot of fun if he ran into the village and told everybody that the wolves were attacking the sheep. So he did that and all the villagers run out to save the sheep um, and there were no wolves and he thought that was great fun and Everybody got irritated. They went back. Then he decided he was going to do it again, you know, a while later after he got bored again. And so everybody comes running out to save the sheep and no wolves showed up. And I don't know if it was the third or the fourth time that he, maybe it was the fourth time. I think he did it the three times. And at that point, everybody said, this guy's full of it. So then guess what happened? The wolves actually showed up. He goes running out, warns the villagers Nobody believes them. They don't pay any attention to them. Ignore, the wolves, ignoring the warnings, even though they're repeated, yeah. you're going to ignore it. And then it actually does happen. Yeah. And then it actually does happen. So the wolves came and ate, ate all the sheep. So the point of it is, you know, I mean, the, 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 the moral of the story is, is, is twofold. One, the, the most obvious one is, well, you know, don't bullshit people or pretty soon they're going to get wise to you and they won't believe you when you're telling the truth. But the other moral is that even though it was just imaginary, the wolves showing up, eventually the real wolves did show up. So eventually the real wolf will show up. In fact, I mean, what is it? Within the next few days, there's going to be three flybys, I think. That's the latest I checked. I hadn't had an opportunity yet to really see the details, but I think, I think that's it. Within the next three days, there's going to be three uh, asteroid flybys and i think the biggest one is what 80 some meters in diameter i haven't followed up on that but yeah that's the reports that yeah it's going to be a couple of flybys a couple of flybys yeah and and you know the question that i'm 
constantly wondering is, is, you know, are we seeing more than we used to see just because we've got better technology and better capabilities of seeing what's out there? Or is the flux of these things actually increased in, in recent years? I don't know the answer to that. It's got to be both. I, I would be inclined to think maybe it's both. Yeah, but it if, seems to be both. If the flux is in, increasing. Why? Why? Yeah. And what does that portend for our future? Right. That's why I mean we really need to keep watching and, and, and documenting these things and, and determine. I mean, you know, our you know, are the, is the, 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 the numbers of these things of the earth crossing uh, objects increasing? Um, because if it is, we need to know that. That'd be valuable information. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's um, amongst the other things that we're doing, I, I do th see that as maybe some kind of a role as, as we progress with this and we can do news events in real time as, as being a watchdog or a, or a lookout. Hey, these these things are coming. We need to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. See what's happening. Follow the news. What 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 could this uh, possibly create? And, uh, and and just be ahead of the curve. You know, be that be that lookout or that that uh, that that forewarning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're trying to do here, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. That is what we're trying to do here. All right. Good. That's what I, that's what I signed up for. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. And we wouldn't want to let you down, Russ. Right. No, you don't want to do that. No, we don't <laughs> want to do that. Bad news. <laughs> so we've been talking about the Younger Dryas events. There's a lot to talk about uh, relative to that period of time. We had a great interview with George. And I hope some of the people listening have gone over to the Cosmic Tusk and had a look because he's got some great information up there if they want to get uh, educated about what could be what most likely is the most significant event that happened to this planet in at least three million years at least maybe five million years somewhere within that range if we look at at, at um, the intensity of these events that that constantly occur throughout the history of the planet we see that there are certain ones that stand out prominently from the background. The Younger Dryas is a huge event. And, and, and they have, yeah. man, I'm sorry, Randall. They, no, they go, just go, go for it. He's, he's, he and his group has compiled the most uh, extensive and inclusive bibliography of, of every scientific paper related to this topic. So we're going we're gonna to have that listed within the description of every video, the link to that. If they, if they can't get to his site, CosmicTusk.com, uh, directly and find that bibliography, we'll have the direct link because he, he has uh, mm. compilated that, that list of scientific papers. So people can do as much research as they want to verify that, that this is what is actually happening right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we left off, I believe, in the last episode with um, discussing um, paleontologist C. Vance Haynes, where he's saying that um, that the and this is this is from two thousand and eight. This was this this was a paper that he published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science Sciences in two thousand and eight. Actually, it was on May sixth, and. Uh, his final, his conclusion was that recent evidence for an extraterrestrial impact, although not yet compelling, needs further testing because a remarkable major perturbation occurred at 10,900 BP that needs to be explained. Now, let me, let me mention 10,900 would be in radiocarbon years, right? And there's a 2,000-year discrepancy between radiocarbon years and calendar years. Okay, so once you've calibrated um, the years 10,900 BP, which is before present, would actually be 12,900 calendar years. Hmm. Right, so just everybody's clear on that because sometimes people get confused when you see these dates and they're, you know, there's these discrepancies in the dates, but oftentimes that's why, because you gotta be clear, are they talking about radiocarbon years or are they talking about calendar years and once they go through and they rectify the radiocarbon years and it varies because of the amount of radioactive carbon that's in the atmosphere but 
um, basically when you go back to Younger Dryas times, the rectification adds about 2,000 years to the uh, radiocarbon dates. So if I say 10,900, in this case, that's radiocarbon years, which in actual calendar years would be 12,900. So j just so we're, we're clear on that. And then he makes the point that, um, that the black layers or black mats are black because of increased organic carbon compared with strata above and below. And he says, although these layers are not all alike, they all represent relatively moist conditions, unlike immediately before or after their time of deposition. So he attributes this to a sudden rise in water table, right? And the sudden rise in water table caused uh, increased moisture on the surface. And that's why you had this black layer that is in a, very close in, 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 in composition to to peat, P E A T, peat, right? But it's it's a it's a thin layer, and so this is interesting because now you could say, well, and, and and see this because of the black mat is so ubiquitous, so widespread. The implication is is that there was a very widespread rise of the water table, right? So if you've got a a, a, um, a black mat site, a Clovis site out in say in New Mexico or Arizona and you have one in South Carolina, and both of them show this evidence of a rise in water table, that suggests that there is something that had to have happened. And most likely that would be intensified rainfall that would raise the water table. Um, so then that year also in the uh, American Geophysical Union meeting for spring, which was actually in May of 2008. So these are right about the same time. Very interesting paper came out by a D.W. Baker, P.J. Miranda, and K.E. Gibbs. And their paper uh, was a summary of their research and evidence in Montana. And this is what they reported. This is abstract number P41A-05. Um, the title of their paper was Montana Evidence for Extraterrestrial Impact Event that Caused Ice Age Mammal Die-Off. Quoting, evidence has been found in Montana for an extraterrestrial impact event previously documented in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and in Alberta and Manitoba. A mammoth fossil site dated at 11.5 ka which and he's mentioning that's carbon 14 dating before present was described in 1969 now because between 1969 and and 2008 the the improvements in radiocarbon dating increased considerably right so a lot of those older dates had to get adjusted one way or another right so the 11.5 thousand years ago was basically where these events were being dated back in 1969 with improvements in radiocarbon dating then, and then calibrating that like I was talking about earlier as far as, as rectifying carbon dating with, with, um, with calendar dating. That's the discrepancy in the date here when they're saying 11,500 years ago, which just coincidentally happens to be close to that other date that we've been talking a lot about throughout this series. But so really, if, if this site was being redated, it would be back at our younger driest boundary at between 12.8 and 12.9. So anyways, a mammoth fossil site dated 11.5 thousand years before present was described in 1969 as the last mammoth occurrence in Montana. The mammoth remains were found in an organic rich layer, a black mat. So back in 1969, they found this mammoth remains in this organic rich black mat layer. They go on to say that the black mat contains abundant charcoal, which is evidence for forest fire, they have in parentheses, black carbon glass foam, 
plant material deposited in a pond and unrusted iron micrometeorites. Scanning electron microscopy, photos of iron micrometeorites reveal fusion crusts, flow lines, and micro-impact craters, all direct evidence for an extraterrestrial origin. Uh, the mammoth tusks, tusks contain rusty pits consistent with iron micrometeorites that were embedded and then rusted out. So, uh, so this was reported in 2008 by an a team that's totally independent of the Firestone Kennett West team, okay? Um, they go on to say that uh, at the Indian Creek Archaeological Site near Townsend, Montana, below the cultural layers and below an 11.2 Ka, meaning 1,000 years ago, right? Carbon-14, they'll have in parentheses so, you, so that you know that this has not been rectified yet. A volcanic ash layer was found, and there are individual glass bubbles about one millimeter in diameter with micro-impact craters. The size distribution of these micro-craters resembles the size distribution of lunar craters, but at a vastly different scale. The carbon glass and micrometeorites suggest a comet rather than a meteorite origin for the extra extraterrestrial material. So that was the that was the abstract, most of the abstract for their paper that was presented at the spring meeting of the American Geophysical Union. And so um, there's a few more things we could get into, but we'll go on here. Um, then uh at the fall meeting of the American Geophysical Union, you had M. Fayek, S. Hull, L. Anovitz, Vance Haynes again, and L. Bergen uh, presented their paper entitled Evidence of Impact Material and the Extinction of the Megafauna 12,900 Years Ago. Um, approximately 13,000 years ago, the landscape of North America was very different from what exists today. Yes, indeed it was. The Clovis people were hunting mammoths and other megafauna that roamed the land at the close of the Pleistocene. Evidence of these large mammals and the material remains of the Clovis inhabitants no longer appear in the geological or archeological records after 12,900 years ago. This coincides with the onset of the Younger Dryas climatic event. The onset of the Younger Dryas appears to have been relatively abrupt, and it lasted for approximately a thousand years. It's been refined, I think, now that the dating is closer to 1,300 years. There have been many theories put forth to explain the sudden changes in climate in human culture and the Pleistocene megafauna extinction that appeared to have coincided with the onset of the Younger Dryas climatic event. Few theories, however, have adequately explained the concurrence of all three events. So you've got the climatic event, you've got the rapid disappearance, the sudden disappearance of the Clovis culture, you've got the sudden mass extinction of the megafauna. Nevertheless, few researchers disagree that something major happened 12,900 years ago. Then he references the point that in 2007, Firestone et al. proposed that an ET event caused the onset of the Younger Dryas climatic event, which led to the extinction of the megafauna and the collapse of the Clovis culture. They go on to say that, um, that in re reference to the skeptics, skeptics argue that the ET markers that have been described by Firestone and others are not sufficient evidence to prove the occurrence of an ET event because evidence for an ET event, such as an impact crater, tektites, shocked quartz, high temperature minerals, and impact material are absent. However, here, this is the same team now, we present for the first time chemical 
and textural evidence of impact material from the Clovis Age Murray Springs black mat layer in Arizona. This is the black mat image that we looked at uh, in the last uh, episode and which can be seen uh, on George Howard's website. The impact material contains iron oxide spherules in a glassy iron silica matrix, which is one indicator of a possible meteorite impact. Chemical analysis of these spherules and the glassy matrices found in the particles from the larger size fractions are compared to the chemistry of carbonaceous chondrites, which is one of the classes of meteorites. They're also compared to impact material associated with meteorite showers and meteorite craters and tectites. The iron oxide rich glass matrix has an unusually high silicon concentration consistent with the chemistry of impact material from meteorite showers. So this, this is a totally another team. This is a third team now that's coming up and finding this evidence in places you know, basically where no one had really looked for anything before. That's important to understand, right? The chemistry of the matrix is not consistent with terrestrial minerals, but is similar to the composition of a eutectic point in the silicon dioxide iron trioxide system with a melting point of approximately 1500 degrees centigrade. Now, eutectic point you know, in a phase diagram of any material that's transitioning from one phase to another, like from solid to liquid or from liquid to vapor, <clears throat> it's going to have this eutectic point. And it's the point where uh, the phase change begins. It's the lowest temperature at which that phase change begins, right? And the F, the iron, actually, it's ferrosulfuric oxide, which is just a fancy name for magnetite, okay? So magnetite actually forms in the reaction, can form in the reaction between iron with steam, which is very interesting and an interesting point to keep in mind. But so he's going back, I'll reread that. He says, um, the chemistry of the matrix is not consistent with terrestrial minerals, but is similar to the composition of eutectic point in the silicon magnetite system with a melting point of approximately 1500 degrees centigrade. They then go on to say that such a high formation temperature is only consistent with one of two things, impact or fulgoritic conditions. You know what a fulgoritic condition would be? That's a lightning, lightning strike. strike. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, fulgur, F-U-L-G-U-R, is Latin for lightning, hmm. right? Okay. So as it's described, it's, it can form tubes, clumps, masses of sintered, vitrified, or fused soil, sand, rock, organic debris, and other sediments that can sometimes form when lightning discharges into the ground. So what basically it's saying the only time you're going to have temperatures of, of 1,500 degrees or more is the, one of those two things. You're going to either an impact or, or a fulgurite type event. Um, but then as, as after he says that those two are the only possibilities, he goes on to say, however, the chemistry of the glassy matrices of the particles is vastly different from that of terrestrial materials such as fulgurites. So, um, yeah, so now here we have, by 2008, we've got three independent teams that have, have found this evidence and have interpreted this evidence as a being some kind of an ET event. And so then uh, also that, go ahead. Wouldn't the chemistry Question. of, yeah, the chemistry of a fulgurite, wouldn't that be dependent on where the lightning strikes and what's in the ground there? Yeah. And it's not making chemical. Absolutely. It won't. Right. right, right, right. That's, and that was the point that he was saying, um, you know, when he says that, um, this is, has some kind of inclusion that wasn't already there in the ground, which is what a fulgurite would, would be. Yeah. Right. As, as, as the definition was saying, it could be fused soil, it could be sand, it could be rock, it could be organic debris or other sediments. So yes, it would, the chemical composition 
and 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 that would leave a very a terrestrial fingerprint. And so what he's saying here is that these glassy matrix matrices are very different from that. So they're not they're not consistent with what you would expect to find a fulgurite being formed out of terrestrial materials. Now, at the same meeting, at the, the fall meeting of the American Geophysical uh, Meeting, uh, you had Kenneth West uh, and a bunch of others, including Wendy Wolbach and Ted Bunch and, and a bunch of others that are now members of the Comet Research Group, along with George Howard, presented a paper. And in their paper, they were looking at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. The reason being that here is an example of, of, of a known impact that has been widely studied, um, you know, thoroughly analyzed about which we have a lot of information. Now, could we draw from that information to try to understand better the, uh, the events around 12,900? So what they did was uh, looked at the boundary clay associated with the KT boundary event, which again, we're going back nearly 66 million years ago for this now. So long before humans are on the planet, right? Here's what the, in their paper, we present the first evidence from the KT boundary clay and rock for shocked hexagonal nanodiamonds. Now, these are diamonds that rather than cubic, which most diamonds are, these are hexagonal. And these hexagonal diamonds form under very interesting and unusual conditions. The hexagonal diamonds has actually got a name. It's called Lonsdalite. And Lonsdalite is named after Kathleen Lonsdale, who was a crystallographer and mineralogist, who actually, I think, was the first to discover these hexagonal diamonds. And so the name, uh, given to this to this mineral now is Lonsdalite, named in uh, uh, honor of Kathleen Lonsdale. So these are being found in concentrations greater than 50 parts per million at Needles Point, New Zealand, and Caravaca, Spain. This is also the first evidence for KT diamonds of any kind outside of North America. No diamonds were detected immediately above or below the impact layer. Cubic diamonds have been reported earlier for North American KT sediments, but Lonsdalite was not detected. Carlisle and Brahman suggested that the cubic diamonds arrived already formed within the impactor, but Howe argued that they were shock produced by the impact itself with the earth. Hence, it is not yet clear that KT cubic diamonds were formed through shock. Lon's delight does not co-occur with terrestrial diamonds, but is found with cubic diamonds in extraterrestrial impact craters. The two examples that they cited were Popagai in Siberia and Sudbury up in Canada. And then they conclude by saying both also have been reported, both cubic diamonds and hexagonal diamonds have been reported in the impact layer of the proposed Younger Dryas impact event at 12.9 Ka, which is 1,000 years ago. So, uh, yeah. So when they're looking, how do they sift that? Or are they just, you just have to look through a microscope to see? Scanning electron microscopy is the tool that's mainly used. And uh, you, have to, you have to sieve the material down to a very small, a very fine fraction because these things are microscopic. So first thing you have to do is, is run it through a series of sieves to get to, to eliminate as much uh, possible as, as the other, other contaminating material. And then you subject to, to, well, there's a whole slew of technologies we could talk about, but one thing you identify them with scanning electron microscopy, but then there are other technologies you use to actually identify the type of crystalline structure than it is. Like using light or something? Because I'm just trying to imagine there's, I can't imagine a physical way you could sort cubic diamonds from hexagonal ones. Maybe there is one, I don't know. Oh yeah, there, there is, yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, for example, transmission electron microscopy is where you shine a, a, a you th shoot a beam of electrons through a very thin specimen. And then it interacts with the specimen as it passes through it and this forms an image. 
uh, from the interaction of the electrons that are transmitted through the specimen. The image is then magnified, focused onto an image device, such as a fluorescent screen uh, or a layer of photographic film. Uh, and they're capable of imaging at, at, at much higher resolution than typical light microscopes. So you can actually see these things. Um, let's see, then what else is there? There's the, uh, uh, the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, uh, which is the analytical technique that's used for elemental analysis and chemical characterization of a sample. So it relies on the interaction of some source X-ray excitation of the, of the material. Uh, and then it's the, the idea is that each, each material has a unique atomic structure. Um, I mean, I've never worked any of these. I've tried to look into them and understand them enough to under, you know, how, how basically how they work and how they can be used these tools for um, identifying materials. But, but yeah, there's a whole, um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of these. So you're going to selected area diffraction is probably the, the technique that's mostly going to be used to look at the crystalline structure right. that allows you to differentiate between cubic and hexagonal nanodiamonds. Okay, um, yeah. So yeah, there, there, there are technologies and, you know, ultimately we're going to have to have all of these things. So Kyle, you could maybe get on the, get on uh, line and see what you can come up with for a transmission electron mic microscope. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think we got some buddies that have a few spare ones. <laughs> so we'll sit three, around. Three, one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to hear more about these um, micro, glass spherules that have impact, uh, craters. impact craters much like the moon. Well, that was all they said about it there. I may have some more information on that. Um, and George talked about it a little bit too, showed us some pictures where the, the micro spherule also has impact. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. I, I remember seeing that, but it's like, it's interesting that they would say, well, this is very similar to the moon. Why did he point that out or she? Well, because basically it's the scale and variance principle again. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what it is. So it's like you're looking at these and, and the, 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 the range of sizes, you could just take that and blow it up. I don't know how many orders of magnitude, but yeah, then it now is going to coincide with the range of sizes on the moon. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's say about the moon. <laughs> Tell us about the moon. Uh, yes, we will. Just trying but to we... do the, the commenters a favor here. They're saying, tell us about the moon. Yeah. So. <laughs> At some point, yeah, we got to get into it. But listen, before we get into that, there's some other things, sort of some preparatory, some prefatory material that we need to look at, um, which we will. And eventually we're going to get to that. But, um, All right, folks. Yeah, moon's coming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. But that is really interesting. I think I'd, yeah. I'd love to see some of those images. Yeah. Well, I might be able to dig up some of those. I may have some of those images, actually. Um, yeah, and I, I am kind of a I'm I love the all the details of how they do the testing. So we probably don't need to go into that on here, but I, I love those kind of, you know, you find you look into this and you say, oh, okay, that's how they're sorting from this, this is the technique they're using to see, you know, the, like these minor differences between these tiny freaking particles. It's really cool, cool stuff. Yeah. And so then, then it's good that you yeah. love that, Russ, because you, you have a ability to take all those details, but then put it in a general sense and relay it to people. So uh, that's definitely coming through in your participation here and uh, oh, other, other people's comments to say that, you know, you, you can you can take a big chunk of info and then Synthesize. narrow it down. So something that we can all understand. So, yeah, that's awesome that you want to take that on because you do a good job at it. Wow. I'm a blushing <laughs> thanks man <laughs> okay um so then they are uh the let's see where was i at oh yeah the bunch the bunch whitkey west kennett kennett etc team um finding this lon's delight um reported at the younger dryas impact event which is very interesting see now that's further um confirmation that it was an ET event. Um, then we'll go, uh, let's see, go back to here. And um, this is a 
uh, yeah, back at the fall meeting, um, until the announcements, this is the same group, Ted Bunch, um, Whitkey, West, Kennett, Kennett, father, son, scientists. And so in their paper at the 2009 meeting, they state this, until the announcements of a possible impact event at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, around 12.9 Ka. K, remember, is 1,000. A just means annum or annual. So 1,000 years, 12.9 Ka. The KT impact layer that resulted from the cheek shalub impact was the only geological boundary layer known to contain coeval peaks in various impact markers, including diamonds. Here, we compare impact markers from the KT boundary and the Younger Dryas boundary and the 1908 Tunguska airburst layer. Very interesting. Yeah. First order markers related to impact and biomass burning include magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, nano diamonds, both cubic and lonsdalite, iridium anomalies, charcoal, fullerenes, grape-like soot, and widespread extinctions. Observations and analytical data for the Younger Dryas boundary are consistent with all of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary layers. While the last three markers are unknown or inconclusive for the Tunguska layer, Selected markers for cratering events, for example, Chicxulub, are one, a visible crater, two, shocked minerals, three, impact breccia, breccia, remember, broken rock, and microtectites. So at this point, these are not known for the Younger Dryas boundary event. So this has been one of the stumbling blocks as far as the skeptics as far as the skeptics and the critics accepting the idea is where's the crater over and over again? Where is the crater? Where is the crater? Right now we know why there was no crater at Tunguska, right? Because it was an air burst. It wasn't a ground impact. It was an air burst. So it blew over about 830 square miles of old growth Taiga forest, but it didn't really create a, a classical crater. Now, interestingly, and this kind of brings us back to the to the Carolina Bay's discussion, and which we will come back to after we have looked at in more detail at the Tunguska event. But there are shallow elliptical depressions under the epicenter of the airburst, which could be significant. Yeah. Right. Uh, so they go on to say that the discussion here is limited to possible origins of the impact markers and not with impact consequences such as climate change or extinctions or whatever. Several origins may account for impact materials in the YDB, which is the Younger Dryas boundary. One, an extraordinary accretion of micrometeorites, which was proposed by Pintar and Ishman in 2008. However, as they say, this is inconsistent with YDB carbon spheral compositions, including the large concentrations of nanodiamonds found embedded within those carbon spherules. Two, oblique impacts into the Laurentide ice sheet. This model is consistent with the lack of a visible crater and apparent lack of cratering markers as above, as described above, and yet also provides for shock production of the many cubic nanodiamonds and lonsdalite found in the Younger Dryas boundary. Whoa. Yeah, so they're, they're proposing in 2000, this is 2009, the idea of an impact into the ice sheet. And as Brad can testify, he and I have been talking about that idea for as long as we've known in each, each other, which is going on 23 years now. Um, I'm fascinated by the concept of an oblique impact, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So he says the Tunguska event is commonly accepted as the result of a near surface aerial burst and has many similarities to the Younger Dryas event. Comet grazing of the atmosphere involving nearly tangential entry of a comet into the Earth's atmosphere with partial detonation and melting, followed by escape of the unexploded nucleus into space. This has the net effect of an atmosphere penetrating aerial burst, followed by global fallout of detonation products. Three of the four above scenarios are plausible. Which, interesting that he describes this grazing event, um, because that is very similar to the, uh, to the um, scenario that I envisioned several decades ago. Rather than a direct impact of a comet, a, a more a grazing event. I even did a graphic to try to illustrate my concept, and I did this graphic probably in the late '90s, and I may have it, uh, may have it right here. In fact, I think. Yeah, which one? Let's see it. Well, okay then. I think we actually ten years ago, huh? Okay. Oh, no, no, this, I think I actually made this, uh, I think I actually made this early 2000s or late 1990s. Um, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yeah, 20 years ago. Um, well, all right. So let's see here. Uh, Randall at threshold. <laughs> here it is. All right. I will do a share screen and you will be able to see. So this was, uh, I'm sure I've seen him. Come on. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Let's see. Um, put it up there. Okay. It's coming. It's coming. Here we go. Here we go. Oh yeah. Right there. Okay. So the, the grazing event is the, is all the stuff from the tail. Is that what you're saying there? Or do you think that the nucleus also comes through the well because what's happening yeah is it's anytime a comet comes near uh you know like a source a, a strong gravity field it's going to begin to disintegrate yeah and that's what we're looking at here we're looking at a, a series of disintegrations perhaps spread over thousands of years but at one point within that cycle of this comet disintegrating earth had a very close encounter and I would suggest that the closest encounter would be the Younger Dryas boundary. But that was probably not the only encounter, because if you've got this very large comet, which might be 60 Going to back. 100 miles diameter nucleus, regularly circling between Jupiter and the sun, yeah. I mean, there could be multiple episodes where Earth is encountering the debris of this disintegrating nucleus. But so that's it, what I was trying to show here, that basically this was a grazing. And see, actually, if you look at this diagram, you see this blue tail. Come, this is the gaseous tail of okay. the comet. This is actually the trail. Those are the, okay. That's, uh, that's, that's thousands of smaller. See, the idea here is that this comet nucleus might, might be 50 to 100 miles in diameter. This stuff's falling off of it. Um, there could be actually literally millions of of pieces spalling off yeah. the smallest of which are going to be in the range you know of, of Chelyabinsk or Tunguska so yeah this what does this does is create the opportunity for multiple impacts over like like Klub and Napier and others have been saying for years there's evidence that there are epoch there are bombardment epochs yeah. and this would be associated with the destruction and disintegration of large comets which they speculate, I think, would enter the inner solar system approximately uh, once every 100,000 years or so, or maybe even more often. I haven't seen their latest um, dating for, for that, um, the, the latest tempo. But often enough that, that um, it could have major consequences for, for terrestrial life. The other interesting thing about a grazing object like that is that it stays in the atmosphere a lot longer than you know a much more <clears throat> vertical impact those yes. can be like a couple of seconds but this thing is just can be burning through the atmosphere exploding dropping things and, and putting heat out for a long time before it goes back out into space yes yeah, yeah. 
Yes. The other thing I was thinking too is that if it grazed the planet, that would obviously like that's a really close approach. So it would have changed its orbit probably enough to where whatever it was before that was regular enough, it moves it out of that regular orbit. And who knows, it yeah. could have hit Jupiter. It could have been swallowed up by, swallowed up by the sun or yeah. the, right. And so what, what happened after maybe a thousand years later or whatever, is that we're running into bits and pieces of the tail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and their point is, is that there could still be enormous amounts of this debris. Right. right. Still circulating out there. And interestingly, as we get better and better capable of, you know, taking a, a, a census of what we share nearer space with, it certainly does seem like, yeah, it's a lot more densely populated than anyone was imagining a few decades ago. Right. So then, same team, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, in 2009, published a report entitled Shock Synthesized Hexagonal Diamonds in Younger Driest Boundary Sediments. Here, we present evidence for shock synthesized hexagonal na nanodiamonds, or Lons Delight, in YDB sediments in North America. The diamonds occur in a discrete layer that is contemporary with and similar to the organic rich sedimentary layers described by Vance Haynes across North America. The best known geological exposure of this dark sedimentary unit is, is 1.35 kilometers from the modern coastline on the west side of, a, of the canyon. And here they're referring to a canyon that is, uh, as I recall, was on the Santa Rosa Islands, one of the main islands of the Santa Rosa, where a 44 centimeter thick, now that's pretty thick, uh, organic rich dark blue gray silty mud black layer rests directly on a gravel deposit mm. right now the rest of the overlying sequence consists of alluvial sands and gravels alluvial what does that mean what what does the term alluvial mean isn't that a water river? water flowing water yeah Accelerator mass spectrometry, or AMS, carbon-14 dates from upper and lower parts of the sequence are statistically similar, suggesting rapid accumulation of fluvial deposits shortly after 12.9 Ka. Now, think back to what we were talking about, rising of the water table, right? Here we have evidence of rapid accumulation of fluvial deposits right after. So what it appears is if there was major climatic episodes that included, if it's alluvial deposit, that means flowing water. If you've got flowing water, you've got to ask, where's the source of the flowing water? And when you start looking at all the possibilities, the one that stands forth most prominently would be rainfall. Torrential rains. Yeah. Torrential rains, yes, exactly. Um, they go on to say that these shock synthesized diamonds are also associated with proxies indicating major biomass burning, such as charcoal, carbon spherules, and soot. This biomass burning at the Younger Dryas onset is regional in extent and coeval with broader continent-wide biomass burning. Biomass burning also coincides with abrupt sediment mass wasting and ecological disruption and the last known occurrence of pygmy mammoths on the Channel Islands, correlating with broader animal extinctions throughout North America. And I will pull up a Google Maps here so that uh, people can see where the Channel Islands here are that we are talking about. All right, we see it. West Coast, Los Angeles, we'll go right down here, and let's see. Here we go. In fact, here's the Channel Islands, which during this episode, these weren't separate islands. They were one single landmass. Uh, but Santa Rosa Island is where this canyon is that they were uh, making these investigations. Santa Rosa Island. So, um, 
yeah. So they were they were actually occupied by mammoths, but these mammoths were smaller because apparently their you know their territorial range was smaller, so they adapted by becoming smaller. But the extinction of these pygmy mammoths on this island, like as they said, coincided with the much more broad scale continental wide mass extinction of the megafauna that occurred. So that that's the islands that it's talking about here. Um, the proboscidians. Proboscidians, yes. Like you've heard the term proboscis, which means schnoz. schnoz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go on to say that the presence of shock synthesized hexagonal and other nanometer sized diamonds in younger driest boundary sediments in association with soot and other wildfire indicators is consistent with a cosmic impact event at 12.9 Ka. And the hypothesis that the Earth crossed paths with a swarm of comets or carbonaceous chondrites producing air shocks and or surface impacts that contributed to abrupt ecosystem disruption and megafaunal extinctions in North America. Man. Yeah. So that's still, what, what year is that now? That was 2009. Still 2009, okay. Yeah, right. So. Uh, presentation at the meeting? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So then, independent, let's see. So here we have another independent team led by T.W. Stafford. Oh, actually, no, there's, but that's the leader of the team. But yeah, they're, they brought in Kennett and West and Wolbach. But this is a testing, uh, the Younger Dryas impact evidence at Hall's Cave, Texas. This was the American Geophysical Union fall meeting 2009. You know where that is, Hall's Cave, Texas? No, is I don't. near you guys? Sounds somewhat familiar. Uh, no, don't recognize it. Yeah. Hall's Cave. While we're going on here, uh, Kyle, Check it out. might might bring that up and see see exactly. It's in Kerrville County. Oh my God! West southwest of Austin, Kerr <laughs> County, K E R Kerrville County. Kerrville County. That's like uh, we work in Kerrville. Yeah, Hall's Cave, Kerr County, Texas. Holy crap. Hall's Cave. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're bringing it home, guys. Backyard. Bring it on home. Backyard, yeah. <laughs> so Hall's Cave in Kerrville County, Texas, uh, provides a unique opportunity for testing the presence of a, here's a word everybody needs to learn and get down, chronostratigraphic datum. Right. <laughs> a chronostratigraphic datum. Is the black mat there? Excellent. Because well, I, we'll see here. This is in a cave. Let's see what they say. So the presence, this is a unique opportunity for testing the presence of a chronostratigraphic datum, in parentheses, the YDB layer, containing rare and exotic proxies, including nanodiamonds, asiniform soot, which is a type of soot that's characteristic of intense wildfires, okay, and magnetic spherules the origins of which remain controversial, but possibly derived from a cosmic impact 12,900 calendar years before present. It's a karst collapse cave in Cretaceous limestone on the Edwards plat Plateau. Yep. <laughs> karst is when you have limestone, it's, it's erodible by water, particularly if the water is somewhat acidic with a low pH. And this is, this is why you find so many caves in limestone bedrock country. Yeah, um, they call them karst windows. Call them what? Karst windows are the openings to the surface. Of yes, this. karst windows are the openings. Exactly, right. So this is talking about it's got, um, it's a karst collapse cave uh. in Cretaceous limestone on the Edwards Plateau. It contains... 3.7 meters of stratified clays grading into clay silts and recording continuous deposition from 16,000 radiocarbon years ago to the present. 
The cave's small catchment area and mode of deposition were constant, and the stratigraphy is well dated. On 162 ex uh, accelerator mass spectroscopy carbon-14 dates from individual vertebrae fossils, snails, charcoal, and sediment chemical fractions. The cave sequence contains an abundant small animal vertebrae fossil record, exhibiting biostratigraphic changes and the timing of the late Pleistocene megafaunal extinction there is consistent with that elsewhere in North America. And at 151 centimeters below the datum is an extremely sharp, smooth contact separating the lower layer clays from an overlying dark reddish brown clay layer that dates to 13,000 Cal BP, calendar years before present, at or close to the age of the Younger Dryas boundary datum elsewhere. This appears to be the most distinctive lithologic change in the deglacial sequence. Um, and then he says uh, that uh, there's a local extinction of four species of bats, prairie dogs, and perhaps other burrowing mammals, and the uppermost occurrence of six late Pleistocene megafaunal taxa, or in this case species, uh, do not extend younger than 12.9. So right there, even these small animals are dying off. Um, so he goes on to say, we collected and analyzed sediments at high resolution above and below the distinct lithologic contact at 151 centimeters. The red clays, which are only two centimeters thick, and immediately preceding the lithologic contact do contain an abundance of nanodiamonds, a cineform soot, Magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, all of which we interpret as evidence for a unique chronostratigraphic marker in the Western Hemisphere. Because the age of this horizon is approximately 13,000 years, we interpret the age of the event as the beginning of the Younger Dryas cooling. Um, so there we have now evidence from a cave in Texas. And as we go, we're going to find out that... Um, yeah, there's uh I really want to give you a high five right now. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna go to that cave. I'm really excited about this cave. <laughs> We're gonna go check it out. Yeah. We'll, oh really? Good. We'll, All right. All right. Let's flip back to that. It, it, we were looking at this. Yeah. Four, 48 species, sixty-two the remains of sixty-two species of mammals and at least forty-eight species of non-mammals. Wow. That they found, found in the cave? Yes. Yep. And it's in your county? It's well, so next door to us, yeah. The next, the next county over, the place That's we work, work like every day in Kerr County, yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I feel dumb. <laughs> and so you guys didn't even, didn't even know this, did you? No. That's yeah, awesome. I hadn't had a chance to look it up before, but I saw that and I thought before our uh, podcast this evening that I wonder if those guys know about that cave yeah. or I wonder if it's near them. Clearly, they've been there. So let me nope. let me get this straight. <laughs> the the deposition is inside the cave. Yeah. Yes. So the cave itself is it collapsed. Like the opening is is older, mm -hmm. at least than 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 the uh, younger Dryas boundary. So that I would think it would have to be right because it yeah. had to come into the cave and then it was preserved. It didn't get eroded away. Exactly. In this cave, I've been wondering why you know we don't have any where are the layers there's there's mammoths here we don't see the black mat anywhere around here but i was assuming must have been eroded away since then yeah well but, in some places it it would have been yeah fascinating so mm -hmm. thank you very much for revealing yeah, that I, fact uh, yeah i think they were saying it collapsed so that that gives it the, the sediment the bottoms of the sediment start sixteen thousand years ago right. so the cave yeah. There, there was no karst window. Right. And then 16,000 years ago, there was a collapse that allowed sediment to start coming in, and it made this perfect record all the way up. Yes. Yeah, we're going. Yes. And so for now, 13,000 years, it's been waiting until you guys got there. Right. Now here we are. <laughs> I'm in love with you, Cave. <laughs> yeah, so you guys just go in there with your shovels and start, start digging. Right. We've got 
to find the stratigraphic context. <laughs> I yeah, think you would be there. Yeah. We would be yeah. In chains. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to 2010. So you know, there's more. Yeah. Oh, there's more. Yeah. And we, we're, we've just passed the hour mark. So. Okay. So we'll go a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I will do a, a screen share here, and we will look at a graph. This was published in 2010. This was from a paper published in Geology in 2010. What caused the Younger Dryas Cold Event by Anders E. Carlson. And basically what this graph is showing, this is from a, uh, a core sample taken from the Greenland ice sheet. And... Up here at the top, this graph shows nitrate um, concentrations, and the one uh, B uh, sh over here shows uh, ammonium concentrations, and the gray bar defines the Younger Dryas. And so what you see here, notice this, the nitrates and the ammonium spike. Now, both of those are proxies for intense wildfires, forest fires on a grand scale. And um, then the oxygen isotope scale is what this you see on the bottom here. And so you'll see that the temperature here drops. See, this is the younger driest beginning, this drop. We've looked at this graph before, right? Here's the drop down and then the climbing up out of the ice age, right? This is, so this is the younger driest. But this, is, this gray bar represents the peak of the younger driest. And so what you see here is you see this massive spike of nitrates that is associated with the Younger Dryas. You also see a very large increase in ammonium. In fact, there's a spike that comes up here that's really tall. So these are proxies for, for wildfires. So what this is showing is that we not only had the onset of wildfires at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, but we had uh, a succession of wildfires, which would actually make sense because in the aftermath of the Younger Dryas event, we're probably looking at initially a minimum of somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of the global biomass consumed in wildfires. But in the aftermath, and in, in with in the uh, as as a consequence of the, um, the the cold that came back during the Younger Dryas boundary. Um, you would have a massive die-off of vegetation. And yeah, so yeah. now what this does is create a huge fuel, lo fuel load for subsequent forest fires to continue throughout the Younger Dryas mm -hmm. because of all the, the, the basically the dead fuel, the dead forests that are found all over the place. And then also, and then you have more lightning because of the, uh, the storms that are happening and stuff. So you end up with... Yeah, yeah. Fires, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is an interesting graph. I won't spend quite as much time on this because this is actually a sea level graph. Mm -hmm. And what you see here is, we, we, we'll get into talking about this too, but notice there are four events here, almost periodic. You'll notice we go, the, the age bottom here, we go back, this one would be what, 310, 20, 30. So about between 330 and 340,000 years ago. Then you come here and just about, um, 240 to 250, you've got another one. Then at, at about 130 to 140, you have another one. And then this is the one um, associated with the Younger Dryas. And so it seems like we've got almost a, a rhythm of these kinds of events. Although, to my knowledge, studies have not been conducted to really look for impact proxies at these other events. Mm. It's probably worth doing. Of course, the problem is, is that you know, each time you have a, a catastrophe like this, it tends to obscure, erase, or eliminate a lot of the evidence that would have existed for an earlier catastrophe. See? So, um, that's, that's one of the problems there. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the most recent catastrophe is going to be the one that's easiest to see. Which is going to be the easiest to see, yeah. But it is actually, strange that, that the scientific community has accepted the proxies for the older ones. The KT, yeah. And yet, when we find so many of those same proxies, they're like, yeah, but you didn't find all of them. Or, you know, yeah, you don't have the crater yet. Uh-huh. 
I mean, proxy they want. Back to this study by Kennett and them, um, it, what they did was they took 27 um, sedimentary samples from Arlington Canyon, which is on the north side of Santa Rosa Island that we, we just looked at, okay? So at 12,900 years ago, because of lowered sea level, this island was joined into one landmass along with the San Miguel and the Santa Cruz Islands, okay? Uh, so what the Kennett team found in an exposure of the west wall of the canyon was two layers of dark, silty, muddy deposit at a depth of between four and five meters, or between about 13 and 16 feet below the surface. In these two layers, they discovered what they reported to be shocked nanodiamonds, and in this case, the special form of nanodiamonds called lonstalite, along with carbon spherules and lots of charcoal. So in their... 2009 report, they state here we present evidence for shock synthesized hexagonal nanodiamonds, which, which I already read to you. Um, so we pointed out that the, that the um, gravel deposits are typically evidence of, of vigorous fluvial currents, as would be associated with a flood. So separating the two dark layers, there's another layer of quartz gravels about two feet thick. Over the uppermost dark layer, it's about two and a half feet of very coarse gravel to rounded cobble-sized rock. Uh, again, evidence of a significant flood passing through the canyon immediately after deposition of the second layer of dark mud. Overlying the cobble gravel deposit is a layer of coarse sand about a foot and a half thick and dating of all of these layers puts them right at 12,900 years before present. Um, so they say, yeah, the final, the rest of the overlying sequence consists of alluvial sands and gravels. AMS carbon-14 dates um, suggest rapid accumulation of fluvial deposits shortly after the 12.9 thousand years ago. So in other words, the deposition of the nanodiamond layer was immediately followed by floods. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, uh, let's see what go on here. Um, it's hard to imagine that not resulting in it just being mixed up everywhere. Yeah. The, the, the black mat layer, you know. Right. Well, here it's much thicker. You don't find that discrete. Yeah. It's distributed through this, this th much thicker clay layer. Ah. Um, and then... It was on Santa Rosa Island where they discovered a pygmy mammoth um, skeleton. Um, and this was published in 1998 in the Contributions to the Geology of the Northern Channel Islands. Um, we have, this was by Larry Agenbrod, who was the head paleontologist at the Hot Springs Mammoth Site in South Dakota, which Brad and I visited along with Graham Hancock back when we did our tour together. We, we went to the Hot Springs Mammoth site. Um, he says, so Agenbrod said that the 1994 discovery and excavation on Santa Rosa Island of the most complete pygmy mammoth skeleton yet recovered prompted additional research of the California Channel Islands. An intensive pedestrian survey of mammoth localities tied to GPS coordinates was initiated for the first time in the history of the island mammoth research and has resulted in the discovery and documentation of more than 100 new mammoth localities. So from that, it would seem that mammoths were quite prolific on the Santa Rosa Island, which, again, it was four, what is now four separate islands was one much bigger island. Um, so then they did a, a study on the, on the, uh, the femur, um, dated it by AMS, Accelerator Mass Spectroscopy, Spectrometry, and it dated at 12,849 years. Uh, so, and then there was a female um, remains found, and this was published in, let's see, this was a from uh, I was not able to track down the uh, original paper published on this, but I did find a account of it in the Los Angeles Times that was dated April 11th of 1987. And uh, 
So they found the remains of a female buried in Arlington Canyon uh, on Santa Rosa Island. So quoting from the Los Angeles Times, dated April 11th, in a discovery that sheds new light on the human conquest of the new world, a team of scientists says that the bones from an ancient woman who lived on the Channel Islands off Ventura County could be the oldest human remains ever found in North America. The extraordinary discovery provides important clues to a critical yet mysterious period in human history, the end of the last major ice age, when nomadic people began populating the Americas, but left little evidence about who they were or where they came from. I'll pause there for a second because this brings us back to one of the, to me, one of the, 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 the overriding questions when we begin to look at this is that when we talk about the Clovis, which we will continue to be talking about and looking at the evidence for these, this, this culture called the Clovis that left their, the, 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 the figments of their culture all over the continent, right? But unlike the megafauna, we don't find where are the remains of the Clovis people. Where are the bones, right? Where are the bones? <laughs> yes. It's as if, almost as if, the, you know, you have this evidence of the quarries, of the campsites, the, the, the tool-making sites, the mounds of, of debitage left over, Maidens. all over 50 sites at least in unglaciated North America. But where are the bones? Right. Anzic 1. Uh, almost, I don't know yeah. About, yeah. <laughs> That's the only I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, we don't know. I yeah. got a whole conspiracy about this <laughs> conspiracy theory about this, but I don't well, we'll get... we'll look at that and if I think that it's plausible enough we can talk about it. All right. <clears throat> I don't know. Okay, so bottom line is she may be the earliest inhabitant of North America we have discovered, said John R. Johnson, curator curator of anthropology at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. It is a find of national significance. Uh, how um, old were they thinking she was? Sorry. Uh, the article goes on to describe uh, the more precise dating performed on samples taken from the bones. Okay. The tests were performed by Stafford Research Laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, one of the nation's preeminent carbon dating labs. The results shown that the bones are right at 13,000 years old or 1,400 years older than previously thought. Hmm. Now, given a margin of error of a century or two on either side, that puts, puts the date of these bones right, right there, almost at the younger, driest boundary. Now, do, does it describe the, like, are they articulated? Are they disarticulated? Are they fragments? I, can't, uh... I, think, it's, I think they're disarticulated. Yeah. I don't think it's a fully, it's not a fully intact skeleton. I don't That's think. Not a burial probably. So it's a, it's maybe just fragments of bones. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it goes, yeah. So that would make the so-called Arlington Springs woman slightly older than the oldest known human skeletons in North America, which came from Montana, Idaho, and Texas, scientists say. So here we have what appears to be a deposit of flood sediments dating right to the onset of the Younger Dryas. And the question I would ask is, was she a victim of the catastrophe? Right. And then I asked this question, were there others who might have perished at the same time? And while we have no specimens of other humans from this place and time, we do have remains of now extinct mammals. So then that was gets into what I was just talking about with the pygmy mammoths that seem to be dating from the Younger Dryas boundary. Um, so yeah, so then the Kenna team looks at, uh, and finds that there were shock synthesized diamonds, um, also associated with proxies indicating major biomass burning. Uh, she's called the Arlington Springs woman. Yes. Okay. Yes. Marking it down. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. What a mystery. Yeah, where it yeah. at? <laughs> You've got it solved, though, right? You're gonna do this. Who me? I'm know, getting pretty <laughs> close. <laughs> the end. Uh, I should have it solved within a few minutes after concluding concluding our podcast tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tune in next week, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so then, I think we should also look at some of the 
skeptics and critics. Because while all this is published, you know, you've got this other group over here that's that's claiming it's all BS, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think maybe that's what we'll save for our next episode. Okay. Because they'd be worth spending half an hour, an hour on looking at, at, at the arguments. In fact, we'll start with a paper by Mark Boslow published in 2012 called Arguments and Evidence Against a Younger Dryas Impact Event. Okay. I think that would be worth doing. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Because the critics do make some valid points. I don't ultimately agree with their conclusions, but they do make some valid points. And of course, you know, this is how science works is because you propose a, a preposterous theory and it needs to get challenged. And, and the Kennett West Firestone team and the Comet research team have been very diligent about responding to their critics. And, and I think it would be very worthwhile to look at some of the back and forth that has taken place because this is obviously a very controversial idea that, that has ramifications for our, our modern world because basically it brings cosmic catastrophe and puts it right on our doorstep. And it has implications, particularly uh, in the context of, of, you know, being, uh, you know, now partaking of the sixth great mass extinction in earth history, which is, which is being claimed by a lot of people. There's a group, you've probably heard them, the Extinction Rebellion. Yes. That is claiming that we are now perpetrating an extinction episode that w well, would be far worse than the Younger Dryas Boundary because it's equivalent to the Great Five in, in Earth history, including the Permian-Triassic, uh, when 95% of all marine species disappeared, including the KT Boundary, right? And we will devote at least a couple of episodes to looking at the Great Five, because I think it's very important to have a better understanding of, of when, when we're being told that we are now perpetrating something on a scale equivalent to those, let's look at what those were so we can understand whether that's believable or not. Yeah. Are, are we now, you know, contributing to a mass extinction that could be equivalent, say, to the KT boundary? And my initial thought is, given that um, there was evidence for, uh, you know, worldwide firestorms, at the KT boundary, that there was evidence of a massive influx of particulate matter into the atmosphere that would have caused a cosmic winter to descend over the earth. Uh, when there was gigantic volcanic eruptions spewing trillions of tons of sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere, literally producing acid rain with a pH of one, Oh. We could go on. I mean, we could go on here, but it's definitely worthwhile looking at, at the evidence for those great five in, in much greater detail. Because then we'll be in a position to evaluate claims that what's going on right now is equivalent to that. Great. I'm down. Yeah. I'm down, man. Yeah. So we talked about um, some of the early research from 2007 now up to 2009. and. Uh, where independent teams are, are, are actually just looking for the first time um, for these things because, they're, you know, these kinds of impact proxies like nanodiamonds and microspherals and magnetic grains are not going to show up to the naked eye. Right. You've got to go hunting for them. And you've got to use very rigorous protocols to find them, isolate and find. And we will look at why some of the, the, the skeptic teams were unable to replicate the work of the Comet research team, which I think it's, it's important to look at because what we're seeing here is kind of almost the embodiment of how the scientific process works. It's a great example of it. Although when we look at some of the, um, uh, I would say the attacks uh, by the skeptics, um, 
Yeah, there seems to be an attitude there. Um, but that's sort of part of the scientific method. I mean, yeah. if you look at the history of science, it's been yeah. doing science and also being really mad at other people <laughs> also doing science. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty snarky, like <laughs> yeah. full snark. Yeah. yeah. Full, full on snark, yeah. So, uh, oh, I, let's see. I'm also fascinated by the concept that over many parts of the globe, there's a layer that's not that far down underneath the ground that's full of diamond dust. Like, can we sort this stuff out? Like, what what would a handful of sorted, you know, nano diamond dust look like? You know, right. Fairy dust, man. Come on. Well, yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't look like anything? I don't think you well, know. If you just had it like a pile of it in your hands, like a ton of nano diamonds, enough to make a pile of dust. Yeah, it'd be really fine stuff. Right, um, it'd be very fine and sparkly. It would be awesome. It would probably be sparkly, yes. It would probably <laughs> be stuff. Yeah. <laughs> nano, exactly. Right, nano. You, you, you mix guys... it up and make a shake? <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> so, I think that's probably a good terminating point for now. Um, of course, we'll pick this up next Dirty week duty. yeah it's good stuff though yeah yeah what i'd like to imagine that we're going to do here is over these episodes here excuse me we will provide a source of information and insight into this younger driest boundary that's sort of unique because I, I you know so that between our what we're doing and what cosmic tusk is doing if people really want to immerse themselves in it and and try to really learn about it we will provide the the resources to do that right yeah, yeah. excellent more yeah more yeah that's right so once again the cosmic tusk.com has many resources on this and a uh, an excellent bibliography of papers and other relevant materials including the critical ones uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah easily labeled colored color coded so you can see here's the you know here's the yeah, that's here's what um that's what cosmic tusk has done his his that's right yeah. and i have pretty much i i probably have every one that they have except maybe i'm missing a few of the ones that came out in the last year or two but i also have some because they basically started with the firestone paper yes i've got a lot of earlier stuff which is when you go through and start reading it you understand that it was already vectoring towards that conclusion. Yes. You see. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a title of a couple of the uh, critical articles. Um, here's one. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, A Requiem. God. Like, nah, we're just going to put this thing to rest. Yeah. Then here's the title of another one. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, a cosmic catastrophe. Uh, another one is impacts mega tsunami and other extraordinary claims. The idea, you know, extraordinary being, well, it's so extraordinary. It's outside the bounds of what we consider acceptable science. Yeah. You know, you, you read these, these titles here and you can almost hear the snorts of derision. Snorts. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, you can almost hear them. <laughs> Mm hmm <laughs> Brad's got it getting it down. <laughs> well, again, I keep thinking of Monopoly guy. Right, exactly. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Brad, if we put some glasses on you in a, in that mustache yeah, like he, he had. Monocle. He needs a monocle. The monocle, yeah, the monocle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> All right. So much for Monopoly guy. Yeah. Fantastic, Randall. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. So everybody can get a hold of us, Cosmographia1618 at gmail.com. Go to the website, Cosmographia.com. You can find the link to the Patreon site there, and we are uh, getting a donate button there, a one-time donate button there as well. That actually should be there by the time people see this and hear it. Yeah, and thanks again to all the Patreon uh, supporters. You don't know what this means to us. This is very, very um, much appreciated. Yes. And 
again, I said this before and we're agreeing as we're getting, you know, getting this underway and find ourselves with a little more time available. We're going to have some, do some things. Yes. Uh, to reward all of those who've been faithful subscribers and Patreon supporters. Right. And we are already, the, the resources that have been coming in from all of the, of the donations is helping us already to step up certain things. We are, we are in, vet, in getting ready to invest in, you know, upgrading certain things to help mm-hmm. the quality of the podcast. So thank you guys so much for that. Cause that's really helping yeah. us out. Uh, what else what am I missing? Patreon.com forward slash Randall Carlson. Uh, so thank you guys so much. I think that's yeah. it. Yep. Thank yeah, you. Let's run it. Good. All right. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, everyone. Good night, as always. See you next week. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. 